Hey freshmen, it is Wednesday morning and I am going to attempt to um, do a, an abbreviated lesson um, from class yesterday, Tuesday. So there were several of you gone for a variety of reasons. And um, while Zoom can work, um, I just find this an easier tool because I can communicate what I communicated in class and we don't have the logistics of trying to follow me around the room with the computer or not be able to hear what kids are saying. So um, I'm going to do an abbreviated uh, lesson um, and then give you some instructions and I'm going to upload this all to Google Classroom. Uh, so uh, here we go. So we did watch a lot of video uh, clips um, in the lesson today and I will send those to you as part of the lesson and would encourage you to watch those on your own because it will reinforce what I'm talking about. So uh, we're still in China. Um, on Monday, for those of you that were not here on Monday, we did boring book work and it was chapter two, section two, and I uploaded a Google Doc to Google Classroom for you to um, uh, load your, um, your answers to that. And I don't think I included the PowerPoint in that Google Classroom assignment, but I've emailed it to all of you, I believe, for those of you that weren't here. So I'll go back into Google Classroom and make sure that the the uh, PowerPoint instructions for chapter two, section two, are also in that Google Classroom lesson. So, so that was Monday. Um, today, Tuesday, we're back in China, and uh, I have included this PowerPoint in your um, uh, Google Classroom assignment, so follow along with me. Uh, the first thing that we did was we briefly went through a review of the boring book work. I'm gonna skip that for this lesson since some of you may have not have even done that yet, uh, but, um, I'm going to jump on down to our fact of the day. So our fact of the day today is Hong Kong, which is a city in the southern part of China. It sits on the coast and um, I have included a, a Google Doc in the Google Classroom assignment that says uh, fact of the day um, Hong Kong and so you can write your five facts uh, right on that document and I will print those for you here and give them to you so you can include them uh, in your notebook. So um, Hong Kong is a pretty fantastic city. Um, it is a world-renowned city um, long before the Chinese took control of it in 1997. It was a British territory. Um, the British gobbled up Hong Kong um, and assumed them as part of their worldwide empire in 1847 following um, a war called the Opium Wars, which the British defeated the Chinese. They took that city, and largely the main reason that the British Empire wanted the city of Hong Kong is because it is an amazing harbor, a natural harbor. In fact, the word Hong Kong means fragrant harbor. Uh, it has a very, very deep natural harbor, and so it's perfect for uh, international trade, exports, imports, <coughs> excuse me, all those things. So, um, let's see here. In, uh, the, in 1997, the British gave back the city of Hong Kong to the Chinese with the understanding that the Chinese would leave it alone as far as manipulating it and controlling it and setting up its um, uh, rulers or the, uh, the lawmakers and the mayor and all of that stuff. They essentially said, we'll leave it alone. We'll keep communism out of it. Uh, they can get, Hong Kong can govern themselves autonomously, but they are technically part of our territory. Uh, and so in, in about, we have about 25 years left. Um, they agreed to do that for 50 years, so in about 25 years, China will probably go in and, and take over the governing system of Hong Kong in some capacity. But right now it works, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not sick, <coughs> but uh, China will go in uh, or has the authority to go in and take it over. Right now, it's working out great for China because Hong Kong is a big money maker for them. There's banking and finance and real estate and tourism. Uh, it trade, all kinds of stuff. And so, um, but Hong Kong functions sort of as a democracy. Uh, they elect their own leaders, their city councilmen, the mayor, um, all of the laws that govern the city um, are done by this elected representatives, by these elected representatives. So um, in time, that's probably gonna change, however. Um, so there are a few pictures of Hong Kong in my PowerPoint. I'm not gonna upload all of the ones that I showed the kids because Google Classroom has a limit on how many, um, the size of the files that I upload, and a lot of times my PowerPoints are too large for it. So um, there are a few pictures in there of the city of Hong Kong. 
It's a beautiful city. Uh, there are um, 7 million, approximately 7 million people that live there, but it's also a big hubbub of tourism. And um, uh, there's a Disneyland there. It's, it's one of three Disneylands outside of the continental United States. Um, and so a lot of people just simply travel there for vacation. There are resorts and hotels and all kinds of fun things to do. There are competing uh, roller coaster parks. Um, one of the videos that I'm going to have you watch uh, is a crazy roller coaster um, at one of the roller coaster parks there in Hong Kong. Uh, and it's built out over the city and has some incredible views. So I'd like for you to watch that. Um, uh, Hong Kong has, uh, because it caters to tourism, it has for every 600 people, it has one restaurant. So if you do the math on that, that's a lot of restaurants for 7 million people. Um, there are more land, uh, I'm sorry, more skyscrapers in Hong Kong than any other city in the world. There are 8,000 buildings that are over 14 stories tall. Uh, that is twice as many as New York City has, just to give you some perspective. Uh, there's a few pictures here of some of the skyscrapers. Um, what else was I going to say? In 2019, Hong Kong had a huge um, trouble or problem with protesting protesters. Uh, the city council of Hong Kong passed a law that would allow uh, the government of Beijing or Hong Kong or of uh, China to extradite people from Hong Kong into mainland China to try them um, for supposed crimes. What happens is, you know, ch the Chinese legal system is not really equitable and so are fair uh, and so they can accuse you of anything arrest you that you don't have the same rights in China that you do here you know the right to an attorney and all of those things so if the Chinese government gets you in their crosshairs they may arrest you imprison you and you may not see the light of day for who knows how long and so a lot of people will flee to Hong Kong where they are theoretically protected from extradition. Extradition means a country comes in or an authority comes in and gets you and, and takes you back. Um, and so uh, the city council was thinking about uh, introducing a law that would allow China to come in and extradite people. Um, and the, the city just completely freaked out. And um, I believe there's probably a little bit of a separatist movement in Hong Kong, meaning that the younger population knows that the writing is on the wall and it's somewhere down the road. The Chinese government is going to assume full responsibility of the city and they're afraid of that. They don't want their rights removed. They, they enjoy democracy. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a separatist movement, meaning uh, Hong Kong, there's probably many people in Hong Kong that would like to uh, create a city state of Hong Kong so that the Chinese don't ever fully control the city. And the Chinese don't want that. They want full control. And so um, this initial protest led to more protests, which led to more protests. And eventually the city was shut down by the protesters. Um, there's even a little bit of a conspiracy. Uh, we talked about this in class uh, that... Um, the protests were completely out of control at the end of 2019, so much so that uh, pr the protesters had shut down the airport in Hong Kong, which I think I read is the busiest airport in the um, in all of Asia, um, in that hemisphere. Uh, and so it was pretty devastating to the Chinese financially and otherwise. Um, businesses were closed, the downtown was closed. Um, the police of Hong Kong could not get it under control. The Chinese were thinking about sending in the military. Uh, and then January 1st, 2020 rolled around and suddenly there was COVID all over China. There was COVID in Hong Kong. Um, and the city shut down, everybody went into, you know, shelter uh, away from COVID. And there has been some suggestion that the Chinese intentionally introduced COVID into uh, Hong Kong to stop the protests. I have no idea if that's true. Um, even if they didn't introduce it into Hong Kong, it definitely shut the city down and stopped the protest one way or the other. So um, since that time, Things have been pretty quiet um, and largely again because of probably because of COVID. Uh, and so I, there are several pictures of the protests and there's a video that I want you to watch um, that documents how intense things got. We had a lot of protests here in the United States for other reasons um, in 2020 and a lot of it is reminiscent of what happened in Hong Kong but for different reasons. Um, okay, I hopefully you got enough um, information on Hong Kong for your fact of the day. Uh, watch the video, the, the roller coaster video, and then also the video on the protest that took place in 2019. Uh, and then we transitioned to a conversation about um, 
what does religion look like in China today? Under the communist regime of Mao Zedong, uh, all religion was, was forbidden, whether it be Buddhist or Confucianism or Islam or Christianity. The state was the god, the government was the god, and all other religions were not allowed. It was illegal. That when Chairman Mao passed away, um, I think the Communist Party reevaluated some of their um, positions on that and felt like there might be some value in a stable moral society, um, primarily to allow the Chinese people to go back to their traditional forms of worship, which is Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism. But as they opened up that door, they also opened up the door to Christianity. Um, parts of Western China have large groups of Muslims as well. Uh, they're close to some of those Muslim countries like the Stan countries, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, etc. Um, and so anyway, uh, in the years, I think it was after Mao, it might have been a little before that, um, the government um, sanctioned a Protestant church called the Three Self Church. Uh, and there is a definition on the PowerPoint um, that is one of our definitions. And so when you get back to school, you can just copy that into uh, your your notebooks, but um, the three self church is uh, the definition for that. There's a couple of pictures of it there is uh, the state sanctioned Protestant Protestant Church of China. And so this is the Christian church that the Chinese government allows. They require the church to um, provide names and addresses, phone numbers, etc., of the people that attend it so that the government can kind of keep an eye on them. Um, in some cases, they in a lot of cases, they actually send um, government agents to sit in the church services to make sure that the pastors are not speaking against the government. Um, the Chinese government thinks equates religion with pol politics, I guess, and um, they assume that pastors from the pulpits or imams in the mosque are going to have a political message and criticize the Chinese government, which of course is not the purpose of Christianity. The Chinese government communism may collapse because of Christianity, uh, but it won't be because um, the pastors are preaching against it. It'll be because the natural outpouring and the multiplication of Christianity changes the heart of people, which changes governments. Um, and so um, this particular, so when the communists took over the country, they expelled all of the Christian missionaries. And so this church, this three self church is self-supporting. And that's where the word three self comes from. Um, in the bottom of the slide, you'll see three self governance, self support, self propagation. And so that was the principles by which this church was started within the country of China. Self governance, of course, meant meaning they, they were in charge of their own church. They weren't getting outside influence from other denominations. Self-support, meaning that they financially, the Chinese people supported their own church. And then self-propagation, um, the people of this church were going to um, pro propagate or evangelize indigenous people of China. So um, rather than being missionaries to Europe, they were missionaries to their own country. Um, and so over time, um, the church has really, really grown. Um, some Chinese Christians think that it's, uh, terrible that they that these churches let the government spy on them. Others think, well, you know, the gospel is going to prosper no matter whether the government knows who's there or not. Um, and I would say that it's kind of fit, uh, it's split about this state sanctioned church. Um, people get saved in this church. Um, government agents that come and spy get saved in these churches. Um, so. Um, but for years, um, from the communi from when the communists took over until um, modern era, uh, the underground church, um, the house churches, have just thrived in China. And oftentimes that's the case when there's, there's persecution. Um, Christianity thrives uh, because people have to take into consideration what their risks are if they accept this faith or this religion, this, this uh, belief system. Um, and in China, it potentially, under communist China, it potentially meant death or imprisonment. And so for someone to say, yes, I want to do this, um, they were willing to give up everything. Um, and so it's a mixed bag today. It's a little bit of both. Um, President Xi Jinping is not a fan of Christianity nor of religion in general, but he's really come after Christianity, um, the physical structures, the churches. Um, uh, he, he encouraged their lawmakers to pass laws that restrict 
religious expression on the outsides of the churches, meaning crosses or symbols of Christianity. And so there's been an effort in the last five or six years to remove all of the crosses. Um, uh, the same would be true of a Buddhist temple, remove the Buddhas. Uh, but, but in particular, Christian churches have been targeted. Um, and then, of course, the, if you were found to be part of an underground church, then or even now, an undocumented, unregistered church, you could be arrested and thrown in prison without all of the rights that we have here and end up making Christmas lights to sell to America. Uh, and so um, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, God has definitely opened the doors in China, um, but it is still a restricted country. So, um, and I think I mentioned this in the other class, but the prevailing uh, form of Christianity in China is Pentecostalism or um, uh, the charismatic movement. Um, they believe in the um, propagation of uh, the spiritual gifts, whether it be healing, speaking in tongues, um, some of the things that we don't uh, follow here, or a lot of people in the United States do not emphasize, is emphasized uh, in the, those churches. Um, let's see what else. Um, there is, there are a couple of videos that I want you to watch. Uh, one of them is a true story about a girl who um, was part of an underground church in China, and she printed, illegally printed Christian documents and distributed them, uh, pamphlets and stuff, and so she's arrested and she is interrogated and she is beaten, um, and she ends up going to prison and she tells her story. She's released now, um, so they, the video introduces her. She's speaking in Chinese with um, subscripts or um, subtitles, but then they transition to an English-speaking actor or actress who portrays what she went through, so it's called Sarah's trail of blood i believe and it's a it's short but it's very it's a true story it's very impactful uh and then there's also a story um by cnn um about five or six years ago i, I saw this video and we showed it in class um cnn has offices in china they have networks in china and so um C china will stream some of their news programs but they censor everything and so in this particular story the story was about the persecution of Christians in China and so they China censored it and, and blocked out that particular program but I found this program uh, and I and I think it's from 2014 uh, but it shows it's still th these sorts of attacks on churches and the crosses on the churches are still going on so I'd like for you to watch that as well um, there are there's a picture of G President Xi Jinping uh, being compared to Mao uh, Mao Zedong and so um, Chairman Xi's picture is showing up all over China, and one of the things that he requires, or, or the law requires, is that an image of him be present in all of the state-sanctioned churches, um, in the um, Buddhist temples and things like that, the mosque, uh, which is kind of weird, but anyway. Uh, let's see here. And then the last thing we talked about, what, and the reason I, I wanted to talk about this is because um, China is hosting the 2020 Olympics, I'm sorry, the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, and I think that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, but there have been a number of countries uh, and world leaders that have brought attention to an ethnic minority in China that has been significantly persecuted by the Chinese government. Um, some people go so far as to refer to it as a cultural genocide, that the Chinese government is trying to eliminate the culture of this people group within China because they're threatened by them and they happen to be Muslim. Uh, so it, multiple millions of people in Western China are Muslim and um, the, they're called the, uh, the Uyghurs. It's, it's a really strange pronouncing, but the reason I'm bringing it to your attention is because I keep hearing it on the news, referred to on the news, and in large part in the context of should the world be sending um, its athletes to the Winter Olympics to compete to a country that violates the most basic of human rights. Uh, these Uyghur um, ethnic minority is being imprisoned, redoctrinated, harassed, um, tortured, um, because of largely because they are Muslim. Uh, and that does not coincide with the culture of China traditionally. And so, um, that is one of the definitions on your PowerPoint. Uh, it's spelled U-Y-G-H-U-R-S, and there's a picture of a uh, Yeager family. And uh, they, look, um, they look Asian, but they 
definitely look more like the people from uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, um, even Afghanistan. The father in the picture looks like he could be an Afghan. Uh, and so um, they are close to the, that area of the world as well. In fact, I think their primary language is um, Turkish. Or I think that's what they said, or Turk, They're, I think so. Um, Anyhow, um, it says they are the largest minority ethnic group in China's northwestern province. They are primarily Muslim, and the Chinese government is being accused of genocide against them. And so the United States decided to go ahead and send our athletes, but they are not sending a political delegation uh, in protest to boycott this, um, these accusations of genocide against the Uyghur people. Um, and so essentially, normally you would send your president, vice president, maybe secretary of state, and some other politicians to represent the United States government at the events. And the United States is boycotting their um, their political entourage. They're not sending anybody. So they're Kamala Harris, President Biden, none of them will be there attending the, uh, or the Secretary of State. They will not be attending the events. And several European countries are following suit. They're sending their athletes, but they're not gonna send a political delegation to represent their countries uh, in response to the accusations against these folks. The very last picture on the PowerPoint is a picture, a uh, satellite image of an area in Western China where the Chinese have built these uh, re-education camps, sometimes they're referred to as concentration camps. Um, it is estimated that upwards of a million Uyghur people have been arrested and imprisoned against their will. Their families don't know what's happening to them, don't know if they'll ever see them again. Um, they're pretty desperate. Uh, and so um, there's a video associated with this um, cultural, potentially cultural genocide as well that I want you to watch. So uh, so not a lot of notes, the fact of the day, a couple of definitions you can copy when you get back and several little videos that I want you to watch. So uh, that's where we ended. There's no homework for Thursday. Um, tomorrow we're gonna, we're gonna segue to, I believe I'm going to Japan tomorrow. We're gonna go to Tokyo. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce that tomorrow and I'll make you a video if you're not back yet. Um, I'll make another uh, lesson like this and upload it to Google Classroom to try to keep you on track. So, so we did take a, a notebook quiz today, but I'm going to have each of you do that when you return. Um, some of you have your notebooks here, and so uh, trying to figure out how to have you take a quiz online without all of the temptations of cheating. Not that you would cheat, but just the temptation that is there. I just i am going to have you take it when you return. So um, hopefully you won't be gone too long. So I uh, miss you guys. Looking forward to a very normal school year. Maybe in February, I'm thinking. Uh, but until then, we're just going to roll with the punches. Um, don't be discouraged. God is still on his throne. He knows what's happening um, and he works all things together for our good. So I'll see you guys later. Bye.